Okay, we're in uh, uh, our second example here. And starting with this example, um, a lot of the numbers and the values that we're going to be getting, which will turn into labels on the axes for our graph, are going to be non-integer values. In fact, a lot of them are going to be irrational numbers. So oftentimes, and I'll mention this again when we get to it, but oftentimes when we're working with numbers like e or pi or if we have a natural log or something like that, most of the time I tell you don't plug that into a calculator. Leave it in terms of e. Or if you get an answer to a problem that's that's natural log of 2 or something like that, just write natural log of 2. Don't plug it into a calculator and get a decimal. But in this section, it's kind of the one exception to that rule, or one of the few exceptions to that rule, I should say. Because without uh, getting decimals for things, it becomes difficult to see where points belong relative to other points on your coordinate plane. So that'll make more sense when we get to the when we get a few steps into this thing. Starting with step one, remember, in step one, the first thing we want to do is get a few things down. We want the domain of our function. Looking at my function, I have a polynomial, 6x squared, and an exponential function, e to the x. Both of those functions have a domain of all real numbers, and so their product will too. So there's really nothing to do except state that the domain is the set of all real numbers, which is what this interval represents. Okay, next up. Um, let's think about uh, my x and y intercepts. So again, the y intercept usually is the easier one to find because you just plug zero directly in. So if I set y equal to six times zero squared times e to the zero, because I'm multiplying by a zero here, the whole thing just becomes zero. And once again, like the last problem, I have a y intercept at zero, zero. But because my y-intercept is the origin, that implies that my x-intercept is also the origin. Now, we do need to be a little bit careful with this. Um, I didn't really mention this in the last problem because uh, that, that one intercept really was the only intercept that we got. But it's possible for a function to have more than one x-intercept. And a function can have multiple x-intercepts, and it often will. So... Um, I probably should not have just stopped at that step in the last problem and said that the origin is our only x-intercept. I should have done some more work to make sure that there wasn't another one that we missed. It turns out that we did not miss one in the last problem, but just for completeness, let's try this the other way around. If I want to find an x-intercept, I set y equal to 0, so that becomes 6x squared e to the x, and then I solve for x. However, algebraically, I have a product of two things equal to zero, which means either this is equal to zero, 6x squared, or this e to the x is equal to zero. However, e to the x is never equal to zero. It only comes out positive. So the only way this could equal zero is if that x squared equals zero, which could only happen if x was equal to zero. And we do, in fact, get the same uh, x-intercept that we got for our y-intercept, zero, zero. Okay? So... The, it, it was worth doing the work here to verify that there wasn't anything else that we were missing. Next up is vertical and horizontal asymptotes. Now, this function will have no vertical asymptotes at all. Because remember, if you have a vertical asymptote, it's automatically going to occur where a function is not defined, and this function is defined everywhere. So there's no chance of that. However, we probably will end up with a horizontal asymptote, and the reason why is because of that exponential function. Remember, the graph of y equals e to the x looks like this. So this is y equals e to the x. And this function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, or the x-axis. We looked at this the very first week of class. Okay, So it's a horizontal asymptote, but the, the graph only approaches that horizontal asymptote going one direction and not the other. Um, so... This is not just the exponential function. It's more complicated. It's 6x squared e to the x. And what I'm seeing here is that as x approaches negative infinity, so as we go this way, e to the x is approaching 0. It's getting very, very small. But at the same time, x squared is getting very, very big um, because, you know, as I plug a negative number into that, I square it and becomes positive and gets big, right? So that is going to be approaching infinity while this approach is zero. That is a type of indeterminate form that we call a, an infinity 
times zero indeterminate form. And these types of indeterminate forms uh, can give us limits that are finite. They don't necessarily equal zero. They don't necessarily equal infinity. They could either equal, equal either of those, or they could equal something finite, like five. Um, the way that you determine exactly what the what this function is approaching as we go towards negative infinity is to use something that we don't talk about in this class. It's called L'Hopital's rule, and it's a way for it's a way of dealing with limits of indeterminate forms. However, that doesn't mean that we don't have any options. One thing that we could do is do handle this numerically. You remember when we deal with limits. All the way back in chapter one, the one of the first ways we talked about um, estimating a limit is by doing a numerical approach, plugging in negative or plugging in numbers that are getting more and more in the negative direction if we're approaching negative infinity. So, if you were to simply plug in negative one hundred, so that's not even that big or that that small of a number. But it's, you know, negative 100 seems like we're going in the right direction. I want to see what happens to this function as I go this way. Do I still get a horizontal asymptote or does something else happen? So if I go like this, 6 times negative 100 squared, which when I square that gives me 10,000, a very big positive number, times e to the negative 100, that's a very, very small number in the sense of being close to zero. What happens when I multiply these? Well, it turns out, I have to say approximately because this is rounded, I get an incredibly small number. It's approximately 2.2 .2 times 10 to the negative 39th power. This is scientific notation. If you don't remember what this is, um, scientific notation is a way of representing very, very big or very, very small numbers that are cumbersome to write as decimals um, in, a, in a more compact notation. But what this would mean is that I would take the decimal from this 2.2 .2 and move it 39 places to the left, filling in any empty space with a zero. So this number is actually 0. 0.000000. There would be 38 zeros, and then I would get to this two here. So that is an incredibly small number. What that's suggesting is that the exponential going to zero is doing so at a way faster rate than the x squared is going to infinity, and it overpowers it, and it's going to drag this function towards zero, even though the x squared wants to go towards infinity. So all of that is to say is that even though there's no horizontal there's no vertical asymptote, we do have a horizontal asymptote at x or sorry, y equals zero, but it only affects the graph as we go towards the left and not towards the right. So I'm gonna put this notation in here to indicate that the horizontal asymptote only matters this direction and not that direction. By the way, don't get confused, this is not the graph of this function. This is the graph of e to the x, and we were just thinking about that as we analyzed this, okay? Now, step two. For step two, remember, we want to look at the first derivative. So to take a derivative, I'm going to need my product rule. Let's start with a 6x squared, and I'll take the derivative of that first. y prime is equal to 12x, leave the e to the x alone, plus leave the 6x squared alone, take the derivative of e to the x, but e to the x is its own derivative, so 6x squared e to the x. In this section especially, we don't want to leave this in this form. We want to factor things. So I notice that I can factor a 6x e to the x out. Over here, this will leave behind a 2, and over here, this will leave behind an x, 2 plus x, okay? So... Now, I'm going to set this equal to zero because remember the goal for this step is to find intervals on which uh, our function is either increasing or decreasing and also any uh, relative or local maximum or minimum values using the first derivative test. So we need critical values if we can find any to do that. Where is this equal to zero? Well, in this first factor right here, if x is equal to zero, I get a zero. And in this factor right here, if x is equal to negative two, then I get a zero. So those are the two critical values for this guy. Let's create a sign chart for this. Plot these numbers. Negative two would come first, followed by zero. And remember, we're picking test points in here to determine whether our function is increasing or decreasing. So 
for uh, this first one, let's plug maybe like negative 10 into our function. Um, here, if I plug a negative 10 in for x, I would get negative 8, so a negative number. e to the x is always positive, so we can ignore that. If I plug negative 10 in here times 6, I get another negative number. So negative times negative, that's going to give me positive. y prime is positive over here. Pick a number between negative 2 and 0. The obvious choice is negative 1. Plug a negative 1 in here. 2 plus negative 1 is positive 1. This is positive, but a negative 1 here makes this negative. So I have negative times positive times positive, which is negative. y prime is negative. Now pick a test point to the right of 0. Any positive number you want. It's fairly easy to see that everything that comes out positive when you plug a positive number in. So y prime is positive there. So that means that we are increasing here, decreasing there, and increasing again there. Not only do we get that information, but from our first derivative test, we can find some relative extrema here as well. Notice that because we go from increasing to decreasing, I'm going to have a local maximum value here. And because I go from decreasing to increasing, I'm going to have a local minimum value here. So both negative 2 and 0 give me local extrema, but I need the corresponding y-coordinates of the points that those give me in order to put them on a graph. So let's find what those are, starting with negative 2. If y is equal to 6 uh, times negative 2 squared e to the negative second power, I need to get a corresponding... Um, y value for the x that I just plugged in. A negative 2 squared is 4 times 6, that's 24 e to the negative second power. Normally I would just leave it like this, 24 e to the negative second power, but because this needs to go on a graph, I want to plug that into a calculator and figure out what is that approximately equal to. So if I were to do that, um, I did it on here on my notes somewhere, what did that come out to? Um... I can't find it, so I'm going to plug it in to my calculator over here one more time. What do we say it was? 24 over e squared. So that's approximately 3.248. Okay. And I had to round that, but that's enough to get a sense of where it's going to be on the graph. I also want to plug 0 into my function. So and remember, it's the original function up here. 6 times 0 squared times e to the 0 is just 0. So notice, uh, when I plug 0 in for x, I get 0 for y, but we already knew that because that's our x and y intercept. So now what I know is that I have a, a local minimum value at that intercept. Let's record that information. We have a local maximum value uh, and the point that it occurs at is this one. So the maximum came from here at negative 2. And then 3.248 is approximately the y-coordinate of that point. We also have a local minimum value at 0, 0. Okay? So that's all good information. Now we need to move on to step three and start looking at our second derivative. So taking the derivative of the first derivative, I'm actually going to use this form of the derivative over here where I'm going to use the product rule. So for the product rule, y double prime, take the derivative of this first function, and the first function by itself is already a polynomial. Or I'm sorry, not a, a product. So I have to use the product rule just on this part. Taking the derivative of that first function, I'm going to get six, uh, 6 just by itself, and then e to the x. I almost wrote 6x. I didn't want to do that. Plus 6x times the derivative of e to the x, which is just itself, times the second function. Then my product rule says leave the first function alone, but multiply by the derivative of the second function. So leave 6x e to the x alone. The derivative of x plus 2 or 2 plus x, however you want to call it, is just 1. So nothing really changes there. All right, we can do some simplification here. I have a 6e to the x here, a 6e to the x here. That can be factored out, but then there's another 6e to the x in this term. So I can pull 6e to the x out of everything. 
If I do that here, that's going to leave a 1 behind. If I do that here, it's going to leave an x behind, so 1 plus x. And that was still being multiplied to this 2 plus x right there. When I pulled this 6e to the x out, it left an x behind, so plus x. Let's multiply this out. This is going to give me 6e to the x times, so multiply the x's, I get an x squared. 1x plus 2x is 3x, plus this extra x out here gives me plus 4x, and then 1 times 2 gives me 2, so plus 2. And we want to set that equal to 0 to try and find points of inflection, and then we can look for changes in concavity. This is a trickier one because this quadratic, even though it does have zeros, um, I can't find them by factoring. I have to use my quadratic formula. Um, 6e to the x is never equal to 0, so we don't need to worry about that. But x is equal to, use the quadratic formula on this, negative b, which is negative 4, plus or minus the square root of uh, b squared, so 4 squared, minus 4ac, so 4 times 1 times 2, all over 2a, which is 2, okay? This is the square root of 8, which is the same thing as 2 root 2, if you simplify, so negative 4 plus or minus 2 root 2 over 2, and I can cancel that 2 with that 2, and that negative 4 becomes negative 2. So I get negative 2 plus or minus root 2. Now that's great, that's the totally valid answer to be getting, but remember, we would like for our, our numbers to be given in decimal form so we can find them more easily on a graph. So you would take a calculator and find what is negative 2 plus the square root of 2, what is negative 2 minus the square root of 2. And we get x is approximately, I should use an approximate symbol here, um, negative 0 0.59 and negative 3.41. That's what the, these numbers would round to, okay? So we're going to use those uh, to, to create a sign chart over here, find points of inflection, and so on and so forth. Um, so if I plug these in, negative uh, 0 0.59, uh, actually that's in the wrong place, I don't want that one to be that, I want negative 3.59. For 1 to be my leftmost value, negative uh, 0 0.59 would go here. And then I'm looking for test points to plug into my second derivative and determine, you know, is this going to be positive or negative in, on, in each of these um, subintervals. I can do that easily enough by uh, picking test points the way we normally would. But there is a trick to this that if you know you're, if you're very comfortable with graphs of common functions, you can work this out pretty easily. 6e to the x is positive no matter what. So this second derivative will only be positive whenever this quadratic is positive, and it will only be negative whenever this quadratic is negative. However, I know what the graphs of quadratic functions look like. They look like parabolas. And anywhere that uh, I get a zero of this function, which we found here, that's where that parabola crosses the x-axis. In addition to that, my leading coefficient on that x squared term is positive, which means I have a parabola that opens up like this. That knowledge of parabolas gives me enough information to determine where my, de my second derivative is positive and negative. This part of my parabola is above the x-axis. That's where the second derivative is positive. Same thing happens over here. Here we dip below the x-axis. We're in negative territory, so f double prime is negative there. You would have gotten the same results using test points, but if you know if you know your graphs, then this is a way more efficient approach. Okay. So with all that information, I'm seeing changes in concavity at each of these values, which makes both of them points of inflection. We have points of inflection, POI. What are those points of inflection? Well, one of them is going to have an x coordinate of negative 3.41 approximately. But what is the y-coordinate? Well, to find that y-coordinate, I would have to take this and plug it into the original function up here. And again, we are now dealing with approximate values, so I'm not going to get an exact answer. But that is okay. Um, for the sake of graphing, we're just trying to get the best idea that we can get. So um, if you take this and plug it into a 
uh, plug it into here using a calculator to work it out, you get approximately 2.3, okay? And then if you use the other x coordinate, negative 0 0.59, plug it into this function, so negative, you know, plugging it in for the x's, in a calculator, you get approximately 1.15. So there I have points of inflection, and I can see what the changes in concavity look like. Let's, note, let's denote the concavity down here as well. So we're concave up there, concave down there, concave up there. All right. We've put a lot of work into this, so now it's time to put together steps two and three to uh, see what we end up with um, uh, as far as a shape chart. So I create this number line. Any number that appeared on either of these number lines in step two or three have to show up here. So uh, zero is my rightmost value. It's the only non-negative number in there. Um, and then I have negative 0.59. From here, I also have a negative 2, and then I have a negative 3, okay? So it splits my, uh, it splits things up into um, five separate sub-intervals. There's a sub-interval over there, kind of like this. These dashed lines do not re represent vertical asymptotes because, remember, we don't have any vertical asymptotes. It's to help me split things up to visualize it more easily. Okay? So what I want to do, for, to the left of negative 3, uh, or, sorry, 3.41, negative 3.41, that's the value here. Um, what do we know? We know that our function is concave up, but if we're less than negative 3, then we're also less than negative 2, where our first derivative is positive. So we are concave up and increasing here. Concave up and increasing mean, so I'm gonna maybe write that right here, concave up and increasing. Our graph would look something like this, okay? Now here, our graph is uh, concave, let's see, we went from concave up to concave down as soon as we passed negative 3.4, but we are still less than negative two in this interval. So we are concave, uh, down now, but still increasing. So if we're increasing, but we're concave down, it's going to look like this. All right. Concave down, increasing. Once we get to the right of negative 2, so we're between negative 2 and negative 0 0.59 now, um, our function is um, uh, it decreasing but we are also concave down still because we haven't gotten past negative five, negative 0.59 yet. So concave down, but now we are decreasing. To be concave down and decreasing, it would have to have this kind of a shape to it. Okay, next up, we pass negative 0.59, to which, uh, which takes us into concave up territory, but we have not gotten to zero yet, so we're still in here where we're decreasing. Okay, concave up and decreasing, uh, what would that look like? That would look something like this. Concave up, but decreasing. Finally, once we get past zero, we're still in concave up territory, but now we're increasing again. So now we're back to something like this. Okay, this is my shape chart. It doesn't mean my graph is going to look like this. It just means that the shape of the curves on these intervals should be roughly this. And because remember, this function is continuous everywhere. So it's not going to look like a bunch of broken pieces. These all connect, right? So coming to step five now. Let's sketch our graph. Our coordinate axes. Okay. And go back to step one. Look for relevant things in step one. We have an x and a y intercept at the origin. So I'm going to put a point right there at the origin to remember that I have to include that in my graph. Horizontal asymptote at y equals 0, which is just the x-axis, and it only affects the graph as we go to the left. I'm not going to sketch a dashed line over the line I already drew for the x-axis. I'm just going to remember that there's an asymptote there. Okay? Now, let's take all of these numbers and include them 
on our x-axis, except to make things a little bit more to scale, let's not actually write the decimals. Let's do this. We have 0, negative 1, negative 2, negative 3, negative 4. All of my numbers here are somewhere in there, right? So I just want to make sure and include those. Um, looking at the y values that are showing up throughout the, the work that I did here, those are going to show up at places where I'm plotting specific points. So I have a 2.3, for example, a 1.15. There's a zero here. I have a local maximum at 3.428. So I'm going to um, put some labels on my y-axis that will help include all of those. One, two, three, four, like that. Okay. Um, I don't see any positive x values or negative y values anywhere, so I'm not going to worry about graphing those or uh, labeling those. Now I want to look around for any other points that I know. We graphed our x and y intercept because the origin was the common intercept there. Um, in step two, I did find a couple of points that are important, but one of them I've already graphed, uh, plotted is 0, 0. The other one is negative 2, 3.428. So where is that? Negative 2 is here. 3.428. 428 is fairly close to 3.5 or 3.5, so I'm going to go from negative 2 and then about halfway, close to halfway between 3 and 4. So that's going to be maybe right about there. And I'm going to remember that that is a local maximum, okay? Um, in addition to that, I have some points of inflection that are going to show up on my graph, negative 3.41 and 2.3. So negative 3.41 is pretty close to negative 3.5, but just a little bit less. So that's maybe like about here. Okay, and then we go up to 2.3, which is probably right about there. So this point is a point of inflection. I'm going to get a change in concavity there. And then um, this point here, we also need to plot. Negative, point, negative 0 0.59, pretty close to negative 0.5, but a little bit further to the left. So I'm going to say it's maybe right about here. 1.15 is probably about there. So I'm going to have a point like right there. That's a point of inflection as well. Four points. Two of them are points of inflection. Two of them are local extrema. Okay. Now I've plotted all of the relevant points. There's no more asymptotes to worry about. So we can start looking at our shape chart. When I'm to the left of negative 3.41, which is where this point is, we are concave up and increasing. And remember, we do have a horizontal asymptote over here. So it is going to do something kind of like this, where it's approaching that horizontal asymptote. Once we get past this point, 3.41, it's a point of inflection. So concavity changes from being concave up to concave down, but still increasing. Okay, so something like that. Then once we get to negative 2, we're going to switch to being concave down and decreasing, which has a curve that looks like this. And we notice that it goes all the way to negative 0 0.59 before we get to another point of inflection. So it's going to be concave down and decreasing, something like this. Then from negative 0.59 to 0, we're still decreasing but concave up this time. So it's going to do something kind of like that. It's not a super dramatic curve, but it's something like that. And then finally, once we get past zero, we are concave up and increasing. That's all the information we have about what's going on over here. Now, there's a lot of ways I can sketch that. I can make kind of a gradual curve like this. I can make it sharper. If you were to look at this in an actual graph and calculator, it gets very, very steep very quickly. And the reason why it does that is because now I'm multiplying x squared times e to the x. e to the x is an exponential function. And remember, in the positive x values, these exponential functions grow extremely quickly. And I'm multiplying it to an, uh, a number that's also growing. So that's going to even speed that progression up. So I, I expect everything over here to be very steep, but still concave up and increasing the whole time. Okay, that's, uh, that's it for, for this second example. We'll do a third example in part three.